And now we're on to item number 11. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Hillary Gittleman, the Planning Director, I'm joined by Jason and Aaron of our staff. Uh, let me start um, with a brief remarks. I, I tried to think today what can a newcomer bring to a conversation like the one we're about to engage in on the Hamilton Project, uh, the appeal. And um, Jason's got a detailed presentation, but I thought I would um, start by um, telling you what I learned in reviewing the code. What I did uh, specifically is go back and uh, read the section of the code regarding context-based design criteria. Um, because I think we're gonna talk a lot this evening about context and about compatibility. And those two words are def actually defined in the code. Uh, context um, concerns the relationships between the site's development to adjacent street types, surrounding land uses, and on-site or nearby natural features quote, context is not specific to architectural style or design, though in some instances relationships may be reinforced by architectural response, unquote. With regard to compatibility, the code says compatibility is, quote, achieved when the apparent scale and mass of a new building is consistent with the pattern of achieving a pedestrian-oriented design, and when new construction shares general characteristics and establishes design linkages with the overall pattern of buildings so that the visual unity of the street is maintained. The code goes on to say that compatibility may be accomplished right. via siting, scale, massing, materials, the rhythm pattern of the street, the sizes, proportion, and orientation of the windows, et cetera, et cetera, although it appears that the authors deliberately omitted any mention of architectural styles from that list. I have to believe that that was intentional. Jason is gonna summarize um, the project that's before you today and, the, and respond to the grounds of appeal related to um, design compatibility and parking. I just wanted to mention one of the grounds for appeal. Uh, the appellant talked about uh, the ARB process, the review process itself. Uh, and though you know, I acknowledge uh, there are probably lots of ways that each of us could think of uh, to uh, refine the process. Um, I would say that you know, if there's a desire to re-examine the process, it, it's not the reason to hold up or um, uphold the appeal of a specific project. Uh, as Jason will explain, the project has actually been in our office for review since oh, it's almost 12 months, you know, since January of this year. Uh, and it's a, a relatively uh, small pro project, I think the net addition of about 8,000 square feet. Um, so I think, um, while we appreciate the critique of the ARB process itself, um, that that um, grounds for appeal would not be uh, one that we would uh, we would see as a reason to hold up or or change the recommendation that's before you. Uh, so with that, let me let me hand it over to Jason. I would like to just say a few words when he finishes, uh, and then after the public comment this evening, uh, we did receive a late letter on CEQA issues. I'd like an opportunity to respond to the public comments with regard to CEQA issues. Uh, that might come up before we turn this over to council. So Jason. Okay, good evening, Mayor Scharf, City Council members. The project before you tonight is the appeal hearing for 240 Hamilton Avenue. The project was originally approved by the Director of Planning back in July, and appeal was subsequently filed in August of this year. So a brief project overview, Hillary also touched on it a little bit, but it's a four-story, 50-foot mixed-use building at the corner of Hamilton and Ramona Street across from uh, the Civic Center Plaza. It's a 15,000 square foot building, which would replace the existing 7,000 square foot building for a net gain of 8,000 square feet. Um, the project itself includes ground floor retail, two floors of office, and two residential units on the fourth floor. It also includes a recessed ground floor, which helps provide better pedestrian friendly features. Um, parking is provided through a combination of four on site spaces, TDRs, and in lieu payments, and I will elaborate more on parkly, parking shortly. Excuse me. So next we have a perspective as viewed from along Hamilton Avenue in front of Civic Center Plaza looking west towards the project site. So just an overview of the timeline. Um, 
Again, as Hillary mentioned, it was submitted almost a year ago on January 1st of this, uh, this year. We had a ARB hearings in June and July of this year with a subsequent recommendation by the ARB on July 18th. The director's approval occurred on July 23rd. Um, it was placed in city council consent calendar on September 9th. And then between now, or between the September 9th consent calendar and today's city council hearing, we've since had the new parking ordinance adopted on December 5th. And that basically eliminated two of the parking exemptions that were previously applied to this project. It's now to the appeal. The appellant is Mr. Douglas Smith, along with 23 co-signers. The reason for his appeal is three-pronged. First, uh, it's the aesthetic quality and its impact on a nearby heritage buildings. Second, staff's analysis of the parking requirements and the project's contribution to the parking deficiency downtown. Again, um, since the appeal, new parking ordinance has been um, adopted and that directly affects the overall parking requirement for this project. And the third appeal um, aspect is the review process itself, which um, Director Gellerman previously touched on. Excuse me, now to the um, design standards. So we basically, staff has, and the ARB have two tools we use to review projects. We have the context-based design criteria and the downtown urban design guide. So first, the, the context-based design criteria basically is a, it helps guide development so it's compatible to adjacent um, developments. It also helps promote the establishment of a pedestrian-oriented type of design. And then our downtown urban design guide is advisory only, that should be noted, and it's there to advise the applicant and staff and the ARB regarding development in the downtown area. Um, it specifically divides the downtown into districts. This project is in the Hamilton Avenue district, which um, basically wants to see active mixed use district, although, along with three, to four, three or more story buildings surrounding Civic Center Plaza to help encourage a stronger urban edge around the Civic Center Plaza. And so next, the parking requirement. So as you can see from the table here, there's two columns. There's existing and there's proposed. The existing floor area, there was some discrepancy in staff reports and just to confirm the existing area is 7,000 square feet. It's 5,000 square feet plus a 2,000 square foot mezzanine. There's currently no physical spaces on site. There are 20 spaces provided as part of the assessment and that accounts for 5,000 square feet. There are six street parking spaces provided. So total parking, it should say 20 assessed spaces plus six street parking spaces. So now onto the proposed parking. There's 15,000 square feet, and that's broken out as 11,527 square feet of commercial, 3,473 feet of residential. So it's also, again, carrying over the 20 assessed spaces or 5,000 square feet. It's providing four residential spaces for the two residential units, which is code compliant. Then it's, um, with the 2,000 square foot mezzanine area, it should say instead of in lieu spaces, it should say eight spaces. And for the 200 square foot one time exception that was removed as part of the ordinance, it should say one space, not in lieu. And then the street parking is being reduced by two spaces to accommodate for the new curb cut on Ramona Street for the parking, um, for the residential parking. So staff had worked with the applicant and agreed to um, the applicant providing two in lieu spaces for the loss of the two street parking spaces. So total parking, four residential spaces, 11 spaces, which are paid through a combination of in lieu fee payments as well as TDR transfers, and then 20 assessed spaces as well as um, leaving one, oh, and the four, on, four street parking spaces. So the last um, slide we're going to be touching on this evening relates to historic compatibility. Um, there are nearby historic resources, including the Ramona Historic District. It's across from City Hall and adjacent to non-historic buildings. And it replaces one historic, one non-historic building, sorry, with another non-historic building. So this concludes staff presentation. Um, I would also like to add that our chief planning official, Amy French, as well as ARB board member Lee Lippert and human, or er, Historic Resources Board member Martin Bernstein are here to answer any additional questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And just one quick follow-up on the parking issue. Uh, we were asked a council question today about really how much discretion the council has with regard to 
the use of the in-lieu parking fee to meet some of the requirements. Uh, and we uh, looked into the code and, and basically the code sets out criteria uh, for projects that are entitled to use the in-lieu fee when they're within this district. Uh, and our, um, uh, our research has uh, showed that uh, basically historically once you meet that criteria you get to use the in-lieu fee. It, it's not like the decision maker can then say, well no, you can't pay the fee, you have to provide the parking on site. Uh, one of the criteria that entitles projects to use the fee is the size of the site uh, and, and this project would meet that criteria. Um, the Deputy City Attorney I think can respond to additional questions on that issue of uh, the council's discretion with regard to the in-lieu parking fee if you have any further questions about that. Thank you very much. And we have a member from the ARB who's gonna speak on behalf of the ARB, I understand, Lee Lippert. Good evening. I'm Lee Lippert. I'm a chair of the Architectural Review Board. Um, the ARB, when they reviewed this project, uh, there were three uh, members. We had a short board. One member was had to recuse themselves. Another member had resigned from the board. And so there were only three members. It takes a majority of the seated members of the board to uh, move the recommendation forward. In this case, all three of the seated members, including myself, uh, recommended approval of this project. The ARB makes recommendations on the quality and character of development to the Director of Planning and Community and Environment. We do not make recommendations with regard to use and zoning, although parcels underlying zoning and use drive the development regulations, providing important criteria we use to, in evaluating a proposal's projects suitability. Those development regulations include setbacks, site coverage, floor area, building height, massing, daylight plane. Further, use, we use context-based criteria in looking how a building fits into the surrounding neighborhood. In this case, the 240 Hamilton Avenue proposal is located in the downtown immediately across from City Hall at a corner of Hamilton and Ramona Street there are several important aspects we look at during our review, including the project's compatibility to the surrounding buildings and structures. There is no ARB or city standard that requires or limits new buildings or any uh, particular architectural style, or that these projects mimic the styles or take their cues from adjacent buildings. In fact, in the Secretary of Interior Standards for Historic Preservation, it, encur it encourages new structures and additions to historic buildings, that they are differentiated and distinct from neighbor, neighboring historic structures as to not create a sense of false history. Building height, the, I, I want for you to, for a moment, I want to take you for a tour around King Plaza. I want you to close your eyes for a second, if you will indulge me, yes. And imagine for a second, um, a couple of things. Uh, the buildings surrounding King Plaza. We have the Cardinal Hotel, which is a multi-story building, almost of, of identical height to the proposed project. Adjacent to that, we have 261 Hamilton Avenue, the university, euphemistically referred to as the University Arts Building. Again, a multi-story building. Adjacent to that, we have the Development Center building, uh, which again is a multi-story building. Then we have a cleaners on the corner of, um, I think it's uh, uh, Bryant and, and uh, Hamilton. And then we have the 300 Hamilton building, which is a multi-story building. All of these buildings are multi-story with exception of the cleaners. The reason I, 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 I'm taking you on this little tour is that there's a pattern here. In our context-based criteria, we encourage buildings of multiple stories on corners because these are actually bookends for what occurs along a block. If you take the 200 Hamilton block, it begins with the, the hotel, 
we have the uh, 200 Hamilton building, which replaced a Burge Clark historic structure. Then we have the Reposado restaurant, which is not a historic building, it's an old building. In fact, when I had moved here, it was Cafe Verona. And prior to that, it was another cafe called Sweet Surprises. And prior to that, that building was Palo Alto Feed and Grain. It was actually a drive-through where you pulled your truck through and they loaded it up and you pulled into the alleyway and out the back with your feed and grain. And then we have the corner, then we have the next property at 240, which was Onyx, which if anybody remembers what Onyx was, Onyx was the cleaning supply place. And they had their windows tilted, they were uh, tinted all the time. They had the Onyx man stenciled on the window, no redeeming character there. And then we had the, um, it was Radio Shack when I moved here. Going down the block towards Forest, we have another mid-century modern two-story building. We do have the Blue Chalk Cafe, which is a historic building. We have the, the, um, the Hawaiian restaurant, Coconuts, which prior to that had been a bagel shop and numerous other restaurants. And then again, we have another important building bounding the corner, I'll finish up here, is the Pacific Art League. Again, another multi-story building creating the bookends and criteria by which we looked at for this building. Thank you very much. All right, so now we'll open the public hearing. And the first thing is the applicant has 10 minutes, and that'll be followed by the, now it's 10. Isn't that what she said? Five minutes? Five and five? I thought you said we have to go 10. Yes, Cara Silver, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Your uh, protocols um, uh, require um, 10 minutes for appellants. Um, and a th with a three minute rebuttal for appellants. And then the applicant under your rules also receives 10 minutes. So who goes first? Um, the appellant goes first. So the appellant goes first. Yes. Not the applicant, okay. Correct. <coughs> so the appellant goes first, and now there were several members of the appellant who put in their cards. I think I've pulled them, but if there are other appellant members, you should come up, and you have 10 minutes that you get to share, right? And then you have a three minute rebuttal. Is that, just wanna make sure we're right on this. Okay, so before we do that, however, I notice we have 25, 26 cards on top of that. <coughs> By my estimation, we're at least 26. We're at least 40 minutes, 45 minutes of public comment, maybe a little bit more. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna put off Maybell, if possible, to um, next week. And so I'd actually like to be able to let people go, staff and that kind of stuff. So I'd like to break for a second and take a motion to um, move Maybell so to moved. next meeting. All right, if we could vote on the board. So, Mr. Mayor. And I believe that passes, but, you know. <laughs> it's either, no um, it's unanimous one way or the other, but. Um. <laughs> yeah, let's try it again, there we go. All right, we have five votes for it. We'll just call it a day. So just so we're clear, this is item number 12 from tonight, which will be continued to Monday, December 16th, council meeting. That's correct. All right. So first of all, we have the appellants, and I have Douglas Smith, Nelson Buchanan, and Michael Hodos, and you'll have 10 minutes, and you can split it any way you want, and if there are other appellants here, come up as well. <gasps> And just to be clear, we're opening the public hearing. Mm -hmm. I was unaware that we would have to split, so I don't know how to do this. 
Pardon me? Okay. Nielsen? You could take all the time you want. You guys can work it out any way you want. Nielsen? It's limited to 10 minutes. It's okay. limited to 10 minutes. Yeah. That's correct. Yep, collectively? Then. Collectively. Nielsen? Over here. Two. All right, can you start? Can you help? Okay, gotcha. Ladies and gentlemen of the city council, good evening. I am the appellant Douglas Smith. I, uh, the fundamental question before us tonight are larger than the appeal of one application. Will the changing face of the city be guided in an orderly manner by wise laws, or will it develop haphazardly? Will the city retain its unique Palo Alto identity, or will it soon be transformed into an anonymous face like so many others? I undertook this appeal and come before you today to interpret a vision of the city of Palo Alto that I find in the comprehensive code in the municipal, or the comprehensive plan in the municipal code. These magnificent documents speak of harmonious development, coherence, consideration, and a visual unity of the streets. However, if they can, if the statutes can too easily yield opposing up interpretations in an instance as important as this one, or on other buildings that have generated large controversy recently, then the council must use its collective wisdom to clarify. For example, comprehensive plan L48 presents a vision, promote high quality, creative design and site planning that is compatible with surrounding development and public spaces. The operative ter term, oh. this is. the operative term is compatibility. It should ensure architectural harmony, but there is confusion how to interpret it and uh, compatibility and related terms. But I believe that the word area would apply to much more broadly than staff and ARB wish to in, uh, interpret it. The ARB, how do you advance this? Oh, page down? Oh, there we go. Um, ARB finding number four reads, as you see on the slide, um, in areas considered by the board as having a unified design character, historical character, the design is compatible with such character. South of Forest Plan 2 was the source of much of Chapter 18's concepts and language regarding context and compatibility. They apply, and the uh, Chapter 18 applies to the entire city, extending the neighborhood concepts from South of Forest Plan. So the word area in all these statutes applies, I believe, to a section, such as a neighborhood, or at least an, an immediate neighborhood, not simply to adjacent structures, or to a narrowly defined district, such as the Hamilton Street District, as opposed to Ramona Street. Window patterns. The windows are the most critical in this case, since about 70% of the Hayes design is huge expanses of glass, unlike any building in the area that would be worth emulating. Mr. Hayes may try to show how his design mirrors the uh, window layout on upper floors of the Cardinal Hotel, but the crucial difference is that the windows on the hotel are punched, openings in a solid wall, whereas the Hayes design appears to be solid glass. Forgive me if I misinterpret from renderings. Any alteration of glass surface, such as frosting, does nothing to change the fundamental overall character. And uh, pity you can't see more closely, but look, um, the Cardinal Hotel designers, and I think Birch Clark was one of them, go to a considerable effort to provide extra articulation, not simply windows, but there are frames around the windows. There are borders around the double windows. You have articulation in the form of relief between the windows. You have more articulation here. And the purpose is to relieve monotony. The doorways here, I see very prominent on the Cardinal Hotel. You can't, in most other buildings, say the, uh, the former ch uh, blue chalk with the um, arched doorways, you can't miss it. In this one, it sort of blends in from a, from a distance, you can't even see the door. That's very common in, in more <coughs> modern. Um, some people like it. Um, I don't think it caters really to pedestrians. 
What about the heritage block? 50 feet across the street from the site in question. I believe that the statutes, I, I cannot imagine that the statutes of compatibility in the comprehensive code <coughs> did not have such proximities in mind. They have to be taken into account. That is to say, the new design must be compatible with the Ramona district. It's the most distinguished in the whole downtown area. As to high quality design, several statutes require high quality design. What is it though? We can start by defining high quality by what it is not. And here are half a dozen elements of unattractiveness, large grids, large blank walls at any level, large glass areas um, are not much better than blank walls, uh, that are blank opaque walls. Use of raw gray concrete, especially with form marks in place. Unfortunately, the development office used to be like this. The, the only <coughs> change is that they painted it. The simple patterns that are repeated monotonously, excessive simplicity for the building size, unfortunately, such as the building that we are in. Those are some ways not to do it, and they're ways that, uh, that have irritated the public on unpopular buildings. Okay, how do we achieve it positively? Well, for one, avoid the above. And then two, the uh, SOFA 2 is a statement that I've quoted here is a concise summary of the value of articulation. For one, has the value of increasing interest by giving the public more to look at, plus it uh, reduces the apparent mass or perceptive, perceived mass. And I believe the compatibility standard, standard should be applied to admirable buildings, not the mediocre ones uh, of whatever era. Let me refer briefly to my public sur uh, survey. Um, where did I go? Okay. Uh, that you're probably all familiar with. To date, 939 respondents. Opinion polls in the last presidential election ran sample sizes of between 600 and 3,000 people. Therefore, I can't imagine that a the sample size for a community of our size is not massive and absolutely representative. The results were 145 architects thought, 56% of them thought the 240 Hamilton design was incompatible with its uh, historic neighbors. Combined with the non-architects, the majority, almost 77% believed it's incompatible. And Ultimately, the process is the problem, the review process itself, and I believe it has to be addressed. The current process is backwards because issues of aesthetics and altering the design don't come up until it's already well, way too late. And so I uh, sketched out here briefly the current review process, forgive me if I've misunderstood anything, I took it from printed documents online, um, but it begins with the applicant starts by submitting the whole thing already complete, if I, as I understand it, and then staff and ARB have to struggle to make positive changes, which uh, in some cases may be impossible. A restructured process has been su uh, suggested by my uh, designer colleague, Richard Elmore, who's been designed, among others, the Garden Court Hotel, a much loved building here. He's been through the process hundreds of times in his 50 year career. He suggests the sequence on this and the following slide. That is to say, there would be a revised workbook, such as this one, which already exists for the residential process, and which, uh, to my understanding, seems to be working quite well. Um, but simply apply it and expand it for commercial development. And so you can uh, read through these items, start out with a workbook where uh, the design would not be developed uh, or would not be submitted whole but would be developed slowly in consultation with the planners with a uh, ideally an outside consultant from the historic uh, preservation uh, firms there's several of them in san francisco already work with the city and with a one or more representatives from the city uh, or from the uh, city's populace, and this has been uh, a bone of contention with, for instance, with uh, the, the good folks behind the Mayville referendum, who, in, and you've heard simming, uh, pleas for um, more citizen participation. Let me summarize. Uh, you have an opportunity to solve longstanding problems. Uh, let's 
consider the vision, the letter, and the spirit of the comprehensive plan and the uh, municipal code. Thank you. Point of order, I, I did not realize we were bundled into the 10 minute uh, rule. I thought I was the regular three minute uh, person. So let me clarify, that was my intention, but since you guys didn't know, we have 30 plus speakers tonight, so I'm gonna give everyone one minute. So I'll just let you speak with your one minute, and why don't you wait and just speak separately then, if you wanna do that. So I'm gonna go through, and you can, we're gonna go through, we're gonna, there's Michael Hodos and a bunch of other appellants, and I'm gonna let everyone speak for one minute then, as well as that. So you guys get some extra time. That's, I'm confused. But not now. But my preference then would be to just let you speak as a member of the public, if I'm, because you were down to like 10 seconds or 20 seconds, so we'll just do that. So now the applicant gets to speak for 10 minutes. Well, basically what happens is you get 10 minutes and you both get rebuttals at the end after all the public has spoken and council members need to do their disclosures for three minutes. Right. And Nielsen, if you would prefer, you could speak as an applicant on the rebuttal for three minutes. That would be also be a choice. You guys can make that choice amongst you because you have three minutes in rebuttal as well. Good evening, uh, Mayor Scharf, members of the council. My name is Ken Hayes with Hayes Group Architects. I'll be presenting the project on behalf of my client, Alex Jovanotto. The architectural goals for the project were to create a building that's placed in our time uh, and respects the past, increase the height at the corner to support the downtown goals, uh, defining Civic Center Plaza or King Plaza um, as an outdoor room, respond to the immediate context of the tree canopy and views of King Plaza, and create a vibrant, highly visible commercial frontage that encourages activities at Hamilton and Ramona. The ARB listened to the public's concerns at two hearings. We revised the design based on the board's feedback. The ARB unanimously approved the design at the second hearing with three quotes, among others. Quote, it's really a handsome building. You've listened to our feedback, close quote. Quote, I think the design of this building is really wonderful, close quote. Quote, this area does not have a unified design character. It actually is very diverse. You have historic buildings, you have modern buildings right up next to each other. The design character is eclectic and it fits in and the building fits in with the eclectic, close quote. So the, the project they approved is a high quality, modern design, responds to the needs of our time, is differentiated by style, but is no less compatible in the downtown than other neighboring buildings. Compatibility is the standard, as we've heard, not style. Palo Alto has never dictated style in the Downtown Urban Design Guide that I showed many of you, uh, as well as the SOFA 2 guide, specifically encourage architects to not mimic uh, the prevalent styles, but to be compatible. Compatibility can be defined at an urban level or considered at an urban level, an architectural level, and an historic level. At an urban level, I think compatibility can be measured by how well the building design responds to the community, uh, the community's goals for the built environment. In this case, we have Civic Center Plaza. 240 Hamilton is located here. And as Mr. Leeper pointed out earlier, the idea is to try to complete this, this plaza and define that outdoor room. This slide here shows that outdoor room and it shows where 240 Hamilton uh, is located here where the guidelines specifically encourage buildings to you know, be 50 feet or taller. Um, in fact, we're at, uh, we're at 50 feet. So I think our project um, actually completes that composition quite nicely. This is a good slide also to just convey the concept for the building 
um, looking out over the tree canopy and the historic uh, university art building located here, um, I wanted to celebrate that view with this building, thus the reason for the corner of glass that is, uh, that is carved out of the building. It sort of reaches out and lets the people there um, take advantage of the wonderful views outside. Um, another urban goal, if I can get this to advance, and there's the, the building. Another urban goal um, is to activate sidewalks and enhance the pedestrian experience by providing recesses, landscaping, display windows, uh, canopies, and quality materials that you see on the board in front of you and in front of me uh, here. Existing site plan, very, very confining sidewalk, probably the tightest corner in all of downtown Palo Alto. Uh, meager, poor, poorly maintained street trees. Um, a, uh, no recesses at all from the sidewalk, no canopies from the sidewalk, and limited display windows. The proposed site plan increases the sidewalk to 14 and a half feet um, on Hamilton, 10 feet on Ramona. Um, we have entries on both frontages. We have canopies, um, if I can show the cursor, canopies that come out here to define the entry, that come out here to define the entry. And then the building line here above actually provides recess so you can get back off the sidewalk and look in the windows or have tables and seating, et cetera. Um, but that white dotted line that you see here is the building above, and that's there so that it respects the block face of the adjoining buildings, which is also critical, I think, for fitting in with the downtown um, design. Architectural compatibility can also, and here's a view of that. Architectural compatibility is, is measured by considering the siting, scale, massing, quality of materials, the rhythmic pattern uh, of, of the street established by the buildings and their spacing, the pattern of roof lines and projections, the sizes, proportions, orientation of windows and doorways, and the alignment of building elements uh, uh, like windows, cornices, and building openings. Uh, we did both these buildings here on the slide at the end of Forest Street. The Ellison's building was first when we did the Phil's Coffee building, a modern design. We actually matched the height of the Ellison's block. We created punched openings that were similar to the Ellison's openings, um, but actually deeper in this case, but maintained a rhythm that was similar to the structure of the Ellison's building. On the second floor, we set the second floor back, just like the Ellison's second floor addition was set back that we did there creating common uses on both those roof terraces that those occupants can enjoy. You see the um, umbrellas up here on top of fills. Walking around the corner, we've created expansive sidewalk to create a, a patio for outdoor dining. I'm sure you've all experienced that. It's kind of bathed in sunlight. It's a great space. It's protected from Alma by the building um, block that's beyond. When we designed the Palo Alto Bike Shop building, it was important for us to maintain a syncopation or a rhythm along the street frontage. Therefore, we just, we just, we developed this vocabulary that modulated the facade. Um, the window pattern up here has been derived from the building next door. You hardly can see it through the trees here, but that building existed, this one did not. And so we took that square pattern and developed it on the upper floors of the building here, and also the column spacing here is reminiscent of the column spacing here. And of course, we engaged the sidewalk with probably the first retail frontage that completely opened up on University Avenue. Although modern, uh, the Joseph Banks building, which we designed, um, is as rich in architectural detail as the Mediterranean building that's next to it. Um, I actually had a client come up to me and say, Ken, I didn't think I could like modern architecture, but that building's fantastic. It has a richness of detail and material. It's got display windows, it has balconies, and it has recesses. And a detail of that recess is here on the right. And you can see this is the recess here where the doors are. This is all display window, the balconies above. Here's a, a Burge Clark building, or maybe it's Pedro de Lemos, I'm not sure, on Ramona. A recess, a display window, a display window that's perpendicular to the sidewalk, a display window perpendicular to the sidewalk. Detail here of these little outriggers is reminiscent of what we've done, what we've done here with the detail uh, in the facade, and you can't see the balcony um, in this shot, but there's that balcony above. We designed uh, this whole block, essentially restored this Burge Clark building. Um, and, uh, and it was important for us to align all of these canopies and the openings on the ground floor. Um, the railing, this is the wrought iron rail. It aligns with the spring point of the arch for La Strada. It then aligns with the openings for Hoya next door, trying to create some consistency along that block face. Same thing's true for the cornice line and the roof line um, at the top of the building. In terms of 
historic compatibility, the Allison's building that we designed, it's very clear. Um, the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines state, quote, new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features. Excuse me. The Ellison building is solid. The old is, the old is solid. The new is transparent, clearly differentiated. The old consists of horizontal bands of bricks. The new consists of hor horizontal bands of glass. This is the building on University Avenue we just finished, a 15,000 square foot addition and a restoration of the Burge Clark building here. Again, you see the alignment of the canopy. The bottom of our tile accent here aligns with the top of the railing. The top of our tile accent aligns with the top of the arched windows. These arched windows, if you took the arched window proportionally, drew a rectangle around it, turned it sideways, it relates to the window proportion we have there. It's not advancing. The structure is very similar in its concept of the Burge Clark building to what we've done here with the building next door. And then they both define a ground floor opening that's a large display area or an area that you can walk into and they both have that as well. So let's go back to 240 Hamilton. Uh, here's the Ramona Street frontage. Um, this is a wonderful example to show the progression of architecture, the progression of historic styles from Pedro de Lemus and Burge Clark, early 20th century Mediterranean revival buildings that I absolutely love, followed by the William Weeks reserved classicism of the Cardinal Hotel located here that was much um, uh, on a much larger scale, much taller, much more massive than the adjacent buildings. That is the historic district, but clearly there's variety there. I'm gonna run out of time. Um, this is our relationship of the building form on Ramona Street. Uh, we've related to the top of the cornice. We related the, uh, the canopies below. You all have this diagram. The transition here to the Burge Clark building is almost identical to what we've done there. Picked up on a detail of the building next door here as an outline, and we've used that outline here to integrate the building mixed use uh, fourth floor to the floors below. It's a detail that runs around the building. The friezes on the Cardinal Hotel relate to the friezes on our building, and if you'd indulge me for 30 seconds. All right, 30 seconds. The body, the body, 30 seconds. thank you. The body of the Cardinal Hotel relates to the body of, um, of our building. And then the pattern of the windows is also picked up in the proportions and the patterning of the windows, windows there. Uh, this shows the colored photograph of the building in the block. It's kind of washed out on your screen today. Um, but the materials are honed, cut limestone, metal panels, porcelain tile on the ground floor. Um, we have cedar siding on the, on the doors, high performance clear glass for daylighting. I think I've demonstrated how the proposed project meets the standards of compatibility. I urge you to support your ARB and, uh, and approve the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, before we go to the public, I think we should do um, council disclosures. Um, each council member should disclose any contacts they've had um, that would influence their decision and give them any new information. Um, council member Berman. So I met with the applicant uh, at their request. I have not met with the appellant. I would have been happy to, um, but wasn't asked to. Council member, Vice Mayor Shepard. I too did meet with uh, Ken Hayes here and the applicant. Um, I, although I'm not sure if this is influencing, I did get exposed to the uh, downtown urban design guide from 1994, which I know has been handed out to council this evening, but this is a public packet information and it was, um, I appreciated being exposed to that. Thank you. Council member Klein. I did meet with the applicant, uh, Mr. Hayes, oh, many months ago, I can't even remember when, back during the summer sometime. Um, and uh, I've had no uh, contact with him or the uh, appellant. Uh, I would note, uh, though I don't think this is required, that uh, uh, my private sector office is located at 285 Hamilton. Uh, so I pass this site virtually every day and am quite familiar with the neighborhood. All right, um, Council Member Schmidt. Uh, I met with the applicant and saw material which is the same as tonight. Um, Council Member Niss. Um, I've met with the applicant regarding this and at other times as well. 
and I never did hear from the appellant. All right, Council Member Holman. I met with neither the applicant nor the appellant, but have had conversation with a couple members of the public. Okay. Council Member Price. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I met with Ken Hayes of Hayes Group Architects. I did not receive any additional new information. It's consistent with what we have before us right here. I was not contacted by the appellant and did not meet with them. Okay. I met with um, Douglas Smith, Richard Elmore, Douglas Smith, the appellant. I met with Ken Hayes, and I also met with the tenant, I believe his name's Forrest, but I can't remember his last name at this point. And received no new information, or that's not publicly available. All right. Now we have a, a series of public speakers. So, right. The first public speaker is um, Michael Hodos, to be followed by John Linden. One minute. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, yes. can I make an argument for two minutes for members of the public? They've been waiting a long time, and this is a, an appeal that's been holding off for a long time. You could time. make the argument. I'm not going to go with it. Just a moment, Mr. Mayor, we have one chart to show you there. Just move that up. How do, we, how do we blow this up here? I can't see it. Is that it? No. Yeah, that's it. Can you make it bigger? <laughs> no, but that's internet access. Where's the, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to expand it. Do you want to, someone else go first while you set that up? No, 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 no. we're, we're here. We just want to expand it. Okay. Where's the, uh, We want to make it easy to see. Where's, yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, down the bottom. Yeah, no, 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 it's there here. It's here, here, it's here. This guy. Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, this is a little different view of the parking situation as displayed by the planning department. There's been a very minor change in this as a result of some negotiations they mentioned. But basically, this shows the outside impact of the parking of this building. Uh, it requires 46 spaces for the commercial space. Uh, 20 of it is assessed space from the previous building. 20 of it is uh, transfer development lights and uh, in lieu payments will cover the other six. This has changed slightly, but the total is essentially the same. But what happens to this when it actually puts put into play is that 28 of those 46 end up being not actually parked because the curb parking, two spaces are lost. The TDR parking space becomes a deficit because there's no actual parking space being transferred. And the in lieu parking space becomes a deficit as well. So 60% of that 46% up there actually have no parking. Thank you. John Linden. One of the most amazing things, in my opinion, about Palo Alto is that there's a nightlife. I don't know of any other community outside of San Francisco, perhaps in all of California and much of the Western United States, that, that it manages to achieve that. It's fun just to walk around. Part of that is the way the buildings look, it's the size of the streets, whatever, and I'm afraid of the large expanse of glass. Uh, that it, in the daytime it looks great, but at night when that all goes dark or whether, you, and if it isn't all dark, you'll maybe have one room with a cleaning lady or something like that. The question is, can architecture enhance community? And my question is, would this sort of uh, architecture enhance community at night? And I think if we just turned off the two slides there and just imagine the whole wall being a dark plane of glass, is that the place that would be inviting and you'd want to go have coffee or whatever in the evening? Thank you. Thank you. Judith Wasserman to be followed by Paula Shaviv. Shaviv. Good evening, Mayor Sharp and council members. I haven't been here in a long time. I'll leave my jokes out. Um, the appellant seems to have two objections. I'm not going to talk about parking. One to the decisions made and one to the makers of the decisions. Um, on the first count, 
on the decisions being made, Palo Alto is not Santa Barbara. We, ha we value inclusion and diversity of cultures, religions, coffee shops, and architectures. We do not have a beautiful historic downtown. We have a beautiful eclectic downtown. And there is nothing in the comp plan or the municipal code that favors traditional buildings. But there is a statement that says, Palo Alto has many buildings of outstanding architectural merit, representing a variety of styles and periods. Among them are neoclassical buildings from the turn of the century, mission revival buildings designed in the 20s and 30s, California modernist residences of the 50s and 60s, boy, a person can't speak that fast, and contemporary buildings of recent decades, and there's nothing that implies that recent decades should be limited to when the comp plan was written. Thank you. Paula Shaviv to be followed by Kent Mather. I'm in support of the denial of the appeal by the ARB's recommendation regarding 240 Hamilton. The appeal based on stylistic concerns is not, not legitimate or justifiable under the current municipal code, nor is it reasonable in substance. I support the ARB finding that the project is consistent and compatible with the character of this district, which contains a diverse mix of historic and modern buildings. I urge the council to consider that just as Palo Alto is a city of creative energy and growth from the arts to technology and from ec economics to science, this city's architectural design environment too should be allowed to flourish, to evolve, and to inspire. It makes no more sense to be required to design to a particular period frozen in time than it would be to require me to appear before you today in a bonnet and hoop skirt. While it is our duty as architects to consider and reflect on the existing architectural <clears throat> context, we must not be forced to simply replicate it. To do so would result in a phony stage setting period piece and would be a sad and stilted design environment not worthy of innovation, animation, and inspiration that is Palo Alto today. Thank you very much. Kemp Mather to be followed by Robert Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Kent Mather. I'm an architect and former executive director of the AIA Santa Clara Valley. Uh, recent events, including this appeal, have illustrated our community's concern about aspects of recent additions to our built environment that involve parking, zoning, and building design. I agree with many of these concerns and applaud the Council's efforts to understand and deal with them. What I do not agree with is how this appeal represents the opinion being promoted recently by the appellant. This is his opinion that the architectural style approved for Palo Alto should be restricted to a traditional Mediterranean one matching some of the city's existing historic buildings. In September, 23 members of our design committee and I submitted a letter of concern to the council on this issue. And many of the co-signers are people who you will recognize as those who have helped create the wonderful and diverse environment we now enjoy including Bill Bussey, who is one who, with Burge Clark, helped the city form the ARB in the first place. Is that it? That's it. Thank you I recommend uh, denying anything about this uh, appeal that has to do with aesthetics. Thank you very much. Robert Peterson to be followed by Richard Elmore. I'm Bob Peterson. I've been a resident in Palo Alto since 1992. I taught at Stanford first with Birch Clark. I taught, I, Birch Clark was there when I was a student. Later I uh, taught at Stanford for 13 years with Birch. Uh, I am completely in support of what Ken Hayes is doing. And I'm also in support of the ARB. We need a group of people who are educated, experienced, creative, who can help make the judgments uh, of what will work in our community. And I uh, hope you will approve this. Thanks. Thank, you. Thank you. Richard Elmer to be followed by Paul Anderson. I don't see Richard either. You're Paul Anderson, right? Paul Come up and speak. And that be followed by former council member John Barton. No, yeah, go ahead and speak now. Hey, my name is Paul Anderson. I think the building is not 
distinctive because no personality it does not fit the area and I'll say that the office equipment clutter is visible from the windows now if you really know what it look like do you know where Pasteur Drive is for leading up to Stanford Hospital once you get past the uh, what is it for Wells Road there's a big building on the right side and it looks just like it you can see everything inside looks ugly one building I really uh, thought that was done very well was on Litton Avenue. I think the restaurant was called Spago, and that building is uh, really, we would like to see more of that style. In fact, there are three buildings. The building where the uh, Palo Alto Times newspaper used to be is quite a nice too. Thank you. Thank you. Former Council Member John Barton. Is John here. Um, Marion O'Dell, to be followed by Paul Carroll. Hello, my name is Marion O'Dell. I live at the corner of Cowper and Everett, 482 Everett Avenue. I've talked to you at least twice before, but traffic and parking are my issues. On my corner, let me tell you what it looks like. Cars overlap driveways, parked cars intrude into Everett, impeding visibility for pedestrians, cyclists, and cars driving down Cowper. It includes a lot of children commuting to Addison and Hayes School on their bicycles. There's no parking for guests or delivery on my block. Traffic is increased as cars circle the block looking for a place to park. Drivers fail to stop at the stop signs. I've lived there for a long time. I've lived there for 26 years. I've also been involved. It's not just my corner, but it's the whole downtown neighborhood north. I've been involved with the survey uh, where we counted cars for the last four or five months. The whole neighborhood downtown north is becoming saturated. It's a, it's a real concern. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul Carroll. Paul Carroll. Um, trying to make this as quick as I can. Uh, I uh, grow up in an area where data analysis is very important. I do uh, uh, verification of models to make sure they work and the models are then used for making predictions that are useful and accurate. I've been involved in uh, county cars in the parking area of downtown North. I've been a resident here for a little bit over a year. Uh, I'm very aware of what the data say and uh, amongst the things the data say, which is almost incon incontrovertible, is that there's an influx of about 800 cars of commuters that arrive during the day. I would love to know if council or staff has any data-driven contradiction to that. Uh, I'm here just mainly to point out the fact that with 240 Hamilton, we saw that actually there's a deficit in parking, which is very important. My CODIS's numbers show there were a couple of uh, dozen that were short, but actually that number is, is not correct. It's probably be more like five dozen because his number is based on 250 square feet per employee, and it's known that that's wrong by at least a factor of two. What we're facing is a situation where things are inching forward. If you're standing in the floodwaters and up to your ankle and it goes up an inch, big deal. If it's up to your lower lip and somebody says it's only another inch, thank you. Thank you. William Ross to be followed by uh, Bob Moss. Yeah, I'm appearing on behalf of one of the appellants. Page 11 of the proposed land use decision says this is a proceeding under 1094.5. <coughs> the last element of that is the denial of a fair hearing. I came with the expectation of a three minute time to raise issues, principally dealing with CEQA. I would hope that the council honors that. On the issue of CEQA, everything that's proposed needs to be supported by substantial evidence. Your own staff noted that the procedures for parking computation changed on December 11th. There's no change in the project description. There's reference to a tire analysis in the um, initial study. There's no supporting substantial evidence for that. The mitigation monitoring plan was not circulated with the original um, uh, proposed negative declaration. On that basis alone, I suggest you recirculate it because the public wasn't informed of the mitigation measures. There is no link to anything to establish that. One final point, and again, I think this procedural issue is critical. One final point is there needs to be a link to the evidence that's before you. There's cumulative traffic that you have knowledge of because of what came before you on December 2nd, yet you haven't addressed it. 
I think the point of order I've raised is critical to the validity of these hearing proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Moss to be followed by Paul Machado. The first problem we have with this project is that 5,000 square feet comes from transfer development rights. That's always been a terrible policy. It should have been killed years ago. Kill it now. Don't allow that ever again. Second, in the parking, it's grossly under, underestimated. The actual number of parking spaces that the project like this will generate is between 85 and 90. And if you think that I'm the only one who thinks parking is a, is a problem and the density in offices is much more than the staff says, look at page 451 of the packet report where Lee Lippert points out how people are being gram, trammed into offices. Where are those other people going to park? Because there's no spaces being cr created. They're all going to go to Professorville. So as you know, we have a parking and traffic problem, and this makes it worse. On the design of the building, if I had more than about 20 seconds, I could tell you some real problems with it. There are issues with the appearance of the building, whether it meets, the, whether it's consistent with the buildings next door or not, it is not a well-designed building. Thank you. Paul Machado to be followed by Chris Donnelly. Hi, my name is Paul Machado. Um, I read the um, Planning Commission report on this, and it says on page 4, 7, and 9, it brings out the usual plus tax, TDMs, TDRs, FARs, in fees. And, and it basically came out with the uh, conclusion that the requirements were met, which is true. But in reality, it's underparked. All the projects that I've read about in the last few months have been underparked. But what's really concerning is that it doesn't mention all the other projects around. The Epiphany Hotel, the 27 University. So this is, this is contributing to a flood. It's like measuring one tributary uh, in a river and trying to figure out what the spring runoff is going to be. It doesn't make any sense. And it's the same thing with traffic. Traffic's a mess. And yet this says this one project isn't a problem. But if you look at all the other projects in the pipeline, it's, it's a mess. And this is contributing to it. Lastly, it is a matter of style. I've talked to many uh, residents in my neighborhood and have a long email list and is that it? That's it. Thank you. Thank Chris Donnelly to be followed by Art Lieberman. I'm speaking in support of the appeal tonight uh, for 240 Hamilton. I urge you to send this project back to the ARB and city staff for major revision because of inadequate review and a lack of transparency regarding the impacts to the neighborhood. The bottom line is Cumulative traffic and parking is a huge problem in the city. They were never considered for this project as they are never considered for any other project. Therefore, the findings of approval for this project that have already happened are based on false data and needs to be reconsidered. Thank you. Thank you. Art Lieberman to be followed by Rob Steinberg. <coughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, residents who are impacted by projects like this feel that the odds are stacked against them by the House. The comprehensive plan should inform land use decisions, not justify them after the fact. However, only the elements of the comp plan that support this project are quoted in the staff report. Both you and the city manager have, have mentioned that there are complex requirements and there are competing uh, uh, statements, but they should be in the, in the uh, staff report if, in fact, it's going to make any kind of sense. Uh, to the residents. I'd just like to make a few comments then about the, uh, the tire report, the tire uh, which, which was mentioned by Mr. Ross. That's something that Palo Alto is known for. It's something that was called out in a, a report that was uh, sent to the uh, San, San Francisco Transportation Authority. It's a, uh, a, a report that talks about traffic infusion into residential environments. The fact that it was not in the report, I think, is an indication that there's something lacking. And uh, the comment also about uh, the cumulative assessment of traffic is something that we really need to, to face. I don't know how many more projects serially that we, uh, we address in this city before we really ask and demand to have this uh, cumulative traffic information available to us. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Steinberg to be followed by E. Philseth. Good evening. Architecture reflects the community's values its culture, and its sense of place and time. Historic civilizations are frequently judged by their surviving architectural achievements. 
anywhere you go in this country or in the world, people think of Palo Alto as being a leader in the way of thinking, exploration, creativity, and risk taking. In my opinion, to constrain, uh, or excuse me, in my opinion, consistent with these values, it would be a shame to limit architecture to its lowest common denominator. Thank you. Thank you. E. Filsa to be followed by Sally Ann Rudd. I, uh, I think uh, you know everybody knows that uh, the, the neighborhood, the residential neighborhoods, are full of cars from downtown, and that uh, big chunks of it are essentially 100 part, 100 percent parked out uh, as we speak. I think we all know what the numbers are. So I brought my scrapbook and uh, just show some pictures here. Um, so there's uh, Professorville, uh, Bryant Street, uh, yeah, Palo Alto Avenue, um, yeah, another street in downtown North. Uh, this is actually the street in front of my house. It doesn't always look like this, but it's uh, actually quite a bit it does. I just walked out one day and started snapping pictures. Uh, my kids uh, bike twice a day through this exact stretch on their way to and from school. And so, again, yeah, it's kind of not what a residential neighborhood is supposed to look like. So, uh, problems. When you got cars parked uh, down both sides of the street, the street's essentially 15 feet narrower. A lot of streets in our, the neighborhoods are narrow to begin with. Um, so it's a, a lot of them are essentially one-lane streets now. It's a safety problem. You can't get emergency vehicles through. Uh, it's hazardous to things like bicycles. This is Bryant Street, which is supposed to be a bike uh, thoroughfare for bikes. But when you have big trucks double parked across it, uh, it's not safe. Um, constant illegal parking, because there's no legal parking available. Red zones, double parking. Uh, corners and fire hydrants, uh, red zones, uh, and so forth. Um, Sideways and driveways. Uh, All right. You know, almost done. Almost done here. This one. Wow. Um, commercial vehicles. Uh, valet parking occasionally in the neighborhoods now. Um, where do they come from? Uh, they come from big office buildings that don't have enough parking. And even if you consider 250 square feet, they don't have enough parking. Like 240 Hamilton. I think everybody knows that 250 square feet is uh, is not correct. Um, where do they go? They go into the neighborhoods. Thank you. And so if you don't want it to look Thank like you. this, stop approving big office buildings that don't have enough parking. Thank you. Sally Ann Rudd to be followed by Janice Berman. The parking's inadequate. It should be calculated on 80 square feet for employee, not 250. Those in-lieu parking spaces are going to go in front of people's houses. The traffic analysis is inadequate. Um, there is no consideration of all the projects that are listed on your website. There's 50 cars here, there's 20 cars there, there's 50 cars there. Pretty soon these insignificant projects become significant, but there's no cumulative analysis. When is enough gonna be enough? When are you gonna do that? There's um, one car a second on Middlefield Avenue. If you dump another 50 cars onto Middlefield, that is slowing everybody on that street down by one minute. That's hundreds and hundreds of people. That's the result of adding these cars into downtown Palo Alto. Um, lastly, I don't think this is the best work that Hayes has ever done. I've got no problem with modern buildings, but this is not a very attractive building. So I hope you do something about the traffic, do something about the parking. It's yet another project. Thank you. Um, Richard Brand, Janice Berman, to be followed by Richard Brand. Hi, I'm Janice Berman. I live at 661 Waverly. Um, people are already avoiding driving downtown to dine, shop, or go to a movie because they can't find parking. Ominously, the high-tech companies that gravitated here will eventually find fewer and fewer reasons to stay. 
The rents are impossibly high, they'll argue. After all, Palo Alto is not San Francisco, though it's trying to be. It lacks a character of its own. It's 30 miles away from the real deal. May as well move back to San Francisco where a young workforce wants to be. In other words, and their Yogi Bears, it's so crowded nobody goes there anymore. Nobody can predict what the city of Palo Alto's future will look like, but it could include a lot of very new, very tall, very empty buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Brand to be followed by Tom Dubois. Yeah, good evening. As uh, Council Member Klein knows, you know my face, so you know who I am, where I live. What I want to say is we are underparked. You know the problem. You know you've written, some of you have written notes about this. This is a development. You need to put a stake in the ground. This, if it were retail, would be fine. We have two hour parking. Retail is fine. But we've got offices which create more parking problems and it's just gonna go out like our, some of the people in the thing is shown out in Professorville. You're gonna have more of the residents. Larry, you'll have more people coming in, new faces coming in saying, we got a problem here. So I think you need to take a look at this. It's a parking problem. It's a development that doesn't work. Yeah, I know it fits the model and it fits the old criteria, but be strong enough to say no. Thank you. Tom Du Bois to be followed by Elaine Meyer. I wanted to speak to the uh, third point of the appeal, which was the review process. Um, you know, it's been characterized as having public outreach. And I wanted to share some personal observations about a review and the notification process. Um, first of all, if you read the report, I, I felt like reading it that it really wasn't objective. I think it presumes and prejudges, as we discussed last week. Um, for citizens, you really have to read between the lines to get a complete picture, and that, that should change. Second thing I wanted to share is something I've observed personally. Um, I walked the streets around the J. Paul project to let people know about the information meetings, all of Pepper Ash. I'd say 80% of people didn't know a large project was being built right across the street from their house. Um, so the point of that is that there needs to be massive uh, efforts, max, we need to maximize efforts for citizen participation. And I think the process is broken in terms of notification. So you should say, well, you may ask yourself, why should 240 Hamilton suffer because of a bad review process, and my question would be, why not? Thanks. Elaine Meyer to be followed by Alex Giovanni. Good evening, Mayor Sharf and members of the council. It stretches the imagination beyond its capacity to see how this four-story glass box can be considered compatible with its surroundings. It doesn't matter how many pages it took to try to justify its compatibility, it defies what the eyes can plainly see. The approval process is broken. The ARB is broken, and it has been for a long time. It's likely that some of the architects on the ARB hope to be employed by the large developers and architects who come before it. And so they better not say anything too negative about a project or they'll be blackballed and they won't be able to work in this town. It's also true. If we could have a little decorum, we don't attack speakers. The exaggerated deference given to this particular architect is an example. It sometimes looks as though he pretty much decides what comes out of the planning department. And then the ARB affirms it. And as you know, the citizens are not very happy with the results. Uh, my suggestion, I have one suggestion for the right. city council. Thank you. But I have no time, which is to stop the revolving door of commissioners and board members who Thank go you. the revolving door and go out and work for private developers. The city should stop that. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Giovanni, followed by Don Hattis. Dan Hattis. Well, in reference to the last speaker, if you want to look at what the developer looks like, it's me. This is my first building. I've never built a building before. I live in Palo Alto. I work in Palo Alto. And I've been running retail businesses in downtown Palo Alto for 10 years. And um, what I want to say is, uh, there's not a whole lot of intrigue here and knowledge of people and all of that kind of thing. All we're trying to do here is, is transform what is a, a dead corner, a lifeless corner pinched into something really beautiful and lively. And 
I think the key to that as a retailer is the retail space. And this whole project comes from that retail space. And just to point out a couple of things that we did, I wish I had more time, but um, it's perfectly sized and proportioned um, for the retail use. It has great windows to display products, to flatter them with lots of natural light. It's also, we've made the sidewalks wider. We've added trees, we've added planters, and we've created overhangs. All of these um, make it great so I can get a great retailer in there and bring life to that corner. Thank, Thank you. you. Dan Haddis to be followed by Todd Simon. Hi, um, I'm speaking in favor of this project. I'm a consumer attorney who's lived and worked in downtown Palo Alto for about six years. And uh, that corner is kind of a dead corner. And I just dropped off my uh, shirt at the dry cleaners right nearby and just realized you know, looking at the space, it's, you know, it's got this beautiful park and, you know, it, it just, uh, it really could be so much more. And I, I was surprised that there's been this opposition to this building. I think, you know, we're a modern city. Google started here, Facebook started here, Palantir started here. I don't think we should be trying to have historical, you know, fake historical buildings. We should have some beautiful modern buildings that really enhance the park and enhance, uh, make me actually want to sit at the bench in front of City Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Todd Simon to be followed by Kristen Hayes. Uh, hi, I moved out here from the East Coast two years ago and uh, my fiance and I spend uh, most of our social time downtown. We really enjoy the mix of contemporary and uh, historic buildings. Uh, when I look at the proposed building, I think it uh, fits in uh, well within my you know, determination of what's a really attractive building. I also just noticing it up there, seeing it up there, side by side with the Cardinal Hotel, felt that it would be uh, not just a really good compliment, but also seems to spotlight, it's not up there now, but seems to spotlight the historical uh, nature of the Cardinal Hotel too. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Hayes to be followed by, sorry, I'm just probably saying the wrong, Etham Gu, G-U-I. Good evening. Um, as a small business owner in downtown Palo Alto and also a resident, I approve look forward to this building actually. I like modern architecture. Um, me and my friends like to shop downtown and I like the idea of the windows and everything. It's nice, especially at night when you're walking by because sometimes you can see through and especially around that corner, I like the idea of this building. Thank you. Thank you. So Ethan, to be followed by Ashley Huntington. Thank you, Mayor and the Council. Um, I want to speak to, uh, with regard to the first point, uh, first item of the appeal. Um, I personally, I, I, I'm, I'm new to this area. I moved here about one, one and a half year ago from Long Island, uh, New York. And I gotta say, I, I really, I'm, I'm in love with downtown Palo Alto and, and the way, uh, the reason why I like it is, is, is the mix it is right now. I really, the picture wasn't there, but I like the comp contemporary buildings myself, and it really looks attractive to me. It will be a place that I want to live, I want to, I want to shop, I want to work at, and I, I just, I, it feels very, very uh, attractive to me. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Huntington to be followed by Peter Giannavato. Good evening. I know Palo Alto very well, and I love the incredible diversity it's exposed me to. If you were to look at a pool of my friends, you would find that while they live here, they're usually not from this country. When they come here, though, they always find something they can relate to, something that feels like home. I attribute this to the, the di diversity. Palo Alto's spirit is a progressive one, a welcoming one to foreigners and unifying home to all. While I appreciate tradition and uniformity, I also feel as if a town and its ar architecture should reflect its people. In this case, too much uniformity is alienating whereas diversity is unifying. A progressive building design only supports this way of thinking. So in the spirit of keeping Palo Alto a progressive, welcoming, and unifying town, I fully support this building and its design. Palo Alto isn't a place that is behind the times. Let it be a place that defines the times. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Giannavato to be followed by Jeff Lewinsky. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I guess I'm fairly fortunate. I was born in Palo Alto, raised in Palo Alto, went to college in LA, unfortunately, and then came back to Palo Alto. 
I've lived in downtown Palo Alto, I've lived in Palo Alto Hills, and now I live in Barron Park, and I've spent a lot of time going through that corner from Forest Avenue out to Ramona, and there is no corner that we dislike as a young 20-something more than that narrow strip next to where Blue Chalk used to be. In my opinion, the building does a lot that actually helps out the area. It widens out the space, which formerly, I'm not sure if anyone has spent a little bit of time down here, I'm sure you all have, but no one really knows about that downtown area at all. No one really knows about City Hall. And when I look around, I see you know an egg that reflects the birth of Silicon Valley. I look over and I see now a tree from Burning Man that's supposed to show a lot of the unity and the progressiveness of the city. And then I look around and we see these old, smaller buildings, especially in this section. Building out that area to me is, is something that really helps out to kind of make the town feel a little bit more personal and uh, progressive. So I think it's a great project. Thank you very much. Jeff Lewinsky to be followed by Doria Suma. Switching. You're switching, all right. But just because of the time. It's fine, okay. Doria, go ahead. So he's going Ready? Okay. Good evening, council members and staff. The staff report tonight is confusing. The current building on site is described by staff as both one and two stories and both 5,000 square feet and 7,000 square feet. Can't be both. We've looked at tons of city documents, talked to staff, previous <coughs> occupants, and all the evidence is that this is and has always been a one story, 5,000 square foot building. Here's the evidence. This city document shows it was built in 1907, not 1938, as a 5,000 square foot building. Here are other city documents from inspections over the years also showing it was one story. The building has always been assessed by the downtown parking district for just 5,000 square feet. In 2011, 248 Hamilton, the larger unit with the supposed mezzanine was advertised for rent. The ad shows it as a 3,000 square feet, which is the size of the ground floor, no mezzanine. If the 2,000 square feet mezzanine also existed, why didn't they mention it? Why didn't they rent it? As is, okay. As is common, the, As is common, the existing building does have space between the ceiling and the roof, but no true mezzanine or office space. That upper space has sloped ceilings shorter than four feet in places. It is also interrupted throughout by trusses about every 10 feet, and these trusses come within 40 inches of the deck. This would never be considered permitted office space. Uh, we thought it might be tall enough for our hobbits, <laughs> but it turns out that even the average hobbit is not tall enough, making this non-hobbitable space. In order for this project to be legal, there needs to be at least 1,327 square feet of grandfatherable upper uh, stair space. Um, there is no, there is not that amount of space. There is actually no um, floor area up there. And as a result, this opens a Pandora's box allowing any building in Palo Alto that has a non-existent floor or a crawl space to g gain the benefit of being floor area. So please do not accept this illegal uh, violation of the city code. Thank you. Thank you. Martin Bernstein to be followed by Nelson Buchanan. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Time starts now, right? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Martin Bernstein speaking as an individual, not as a member of any group or any board. You are all familiar with uh, this urban design guideline in which you're basing your conversations tonight. Uh, quoting page one, this guide is um, not intended to be binding or regulatory in nature. And um, page 57, architecture guidelines, uh, mimicking context is not always appropriate. In my personal opinion, mimicking architectu uh, historical architectural styles is a weak cultural response. Compatibility is based on uh, texture, harmony, balance, rhythm, contrast, proportion, massing, and texture. In this booklet, it quotes specifically, architectural style is not a recommendation of this guideline. 
You've seen my uh, attachment H, uh, the diagram showing the history of great cities have uh, consistent style buildings uh, surrounded downtown in terms of compatibility. Urban uh, downtown Palo Alto Civic Hall has three tall uh, uh, historic, uh, sorry, three tall modern buildings. 240 is also modern. That completes the uh, completion of that urban space. That's the main issue of the urban space around Civic Plaza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nelson Buchanan will be followed by Joe Hirsch. Nelson was going to do the three minute rebuttal. So, Nelson, you chose to speak now or do the three minute rebuttal? Uh, let me just speak and hold my peace at this point. All right. Um, it's as if we're in alternate universes when we come to objective data about the parking imbalance. Um, the only way I'd like to close this comment is that. We've been here repetitively, neighborhood after neighborhood. I'm here only because I care about the quality of my neighborhood. I care about the intrusion of commuter parking lot. I care about the deterioration of, of spillover traffic. Um, the best way to close my remarks and try to make the point about this project is one of several that are outpacing the supply of parking spaces. I don't have time to go into it. You will not even allow the time to do it. Um, hopefully, with the new planning director, we'll be able to reconcile some of these differences. But I'll close not with the Hoppets, but with the Road Runner and Willie Coyote. That you know the cartoon is that there's never a completion of the chase. This project is like the like the Road Runner. It stings so far ahead of the Coyote that we're never going to catch up. Another 40, 30 parking places, project by project, will not solve the problem. Thank you. Joe Hirsch to be followed by Brad Eakin. I took Mr. Smith's survey and admittedly I'm a traditionalist. When I go to Lucy Stern, when I go to uh, the Newell Library when it reopens, when I go to even the post office on Hamilton, I have a sense of history here in Palo Alto. Uh, this building at 240 Hamilton uh, is a modern building as is the library at Mitchell Park. I don't think either of them the latter two will reflect history 20 or 30 years down the road. I prefer to see something that is consistent and makes you feel like you are on a continuum dealing with historical buildings uh, of significance that will be appreciated 30, 40, 50, and 60 years down the road. So I uh, support the appeal and I uh, object to this particular very modern design. Thank you, Brad Eakin to be followed by Andrew Wong. Yes, one defining aspect of Palo Alto that I truly love is really the diversity within our community, diversity of our businesses, diversity of our residents, industries, et cetera. This type of diversity is something that we really should celebrate, and that type of diversity should not stop our building architecture. I realize everyone has their own personal taste in building architecture, that's natural. Um, the city has done a great job identifying and incentivizing property owners to preserve historically significant properties. Those, those historical properties have helped identify, had defined Palo Alto's identity over the years. At the same time, it's a large number of properties that have zero historical significance and should not be subject to stringent historical design criteria. Personally, I believe Ken Hayes has designed a beautiful building. 240 Hamilton is cutting edge and high tech. These two defining terms have helped shape our local community and help us to become globally recognized for innovation and help challenge the status quo. That type of diversity is something we really should be celebrating and recognize as part of our culture. Thank you. Andrew Wong. Let me check it out now. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm a res longtime resident in Palo Alto and just, had to go, uh, just to wanted to echo some of the statements that were said by some of the uh, the public here. Um, I think the ARB did an excellent job of uh, evaluating the compatibility requirements of this building. I think um, in particular, this building um, needs to dis be distinguished from the evaluation of other buildings like the hotel or like the um, post office because this is ground floor retail and in the CDC, one of the desires of the city planners was to design more ground floor retail that, be, that would appeal to uh, um, its residents, and uh, I think this building does an excellent job of uh, presenting ground floor retail in an exciting and uh, modern and fresh way that's going to attract um, people to the city. Thank you. 
Thanks. And that was our last public speaker, but we have three minutes for both the appellant and the applicant. If the appellant would like to come up and give three minutes of rebuttal, up to you don't have to use it all. I'm discovering tonight that I am not a cunning political operator. I am very grateful to Mayor Scharf and to Councilmember Holman for devoting quite a bit of time to a meeting with me and it was uh, most informative. Um, I probably should have uh, contacted the rest of you folks to uh, get your opinions, uh, but I know that you have an awful lot of uh, food on your plate, and so uh, I have uh, kind of let myself down. Anyway, architects think that their modern style is the present and the future, while traditional architectural styles they regard as uh, done gone the past. But 80% of new building is traditional building because it's residential and the homeowner will not pay for modern design by and large. The architects seem to have gained control of the review process, not only here, everywhere. So they know how to push their abstract designs through the gauntlet, particularly in the uh, commercial and public uh, domain. Mr. Hayes does not seem to recognize the drastic difference, commenting on his uh, presentation a while ago, in character between arched recesses and his abstract recesses, but the public notices immediately. Some of my friends in the audience have commented on this. Another issue, staff reports and the ARB deliberations do not support the findings on quality and compatibility with an objective rationale. I read them quite closely looking for that. I didn't see it. They simply make statements and assume they will be accepted as true. This is a weakness which I have suggested be corrected by a revised process. And then um, I am afraid that if Mr. Hayes' technical concept of compatibility is applied, that the statutes will cease to have real meaning with respect to compatibility and the requirement for high quality. Compatibility and high quality must be clarified by the city council. I think this is critical because ignoring or misunderstanding them has led to a long string of controversial projects and howls of public protest, and they are undermining public confidence in city institutions. I appeal to you to honor and clarify the spirit and the letter of the statutes I've been referring to. Thank you. Thank you. And now the applicant will have three minutes. Ken Hayes, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council. Um, the, the parking issue was debated and decisions were made on October 21st. And um, I just want to point out that uh, my client is complying with, with the, new, the new rules that, that came out of that at considerable um, expense that had not been originally uh, contemplated. Uh, diversity of architectural style gives our city life and defines who we are um, as, a, as a community. Uh, Palo Alto is recognized worldwide for its entrepreneurial uh, environment, for its innovation, for its technology, for its leadership on environmental concerns and sustainability. I mean, the daylighting in this building will be phenomenal. <clears throat> Our architecture should be part of the forward thinking and not stuck in the past. Let's write the book or lead the way to the future. Let's innovate and inspire new ideas without forgetting the past. There's a lot to learn there, and hopefully I showed some of that tonight, but with our sites, focused on, on the future. Let's not enthrone historic styles in our architectural future. Compatibility is the standard. I ask you to support your ARB and their approval of this exciting project for Palo Alto. Thank you this evening. Thank you very much. And now we're closing the public hearing and we're returning to council for comments, questions, and motions. Um, council Member Niss. Um, thank you, Mayor Scharf. This has been uh, a long process, and I think in many ways a, a complex process. But at the heart of this is a very peculiar issue. So let me first um, make the recommendation, and then if I get a second, I'll speak to it. The recommendation is to adopt the mitigated dec declaration, which is attachment G mitigation and monitoring report attachment K. Maybe I can stop there. It's obviously the two parts 
of the recommendation which are before you and perhaps you could throw it up on the board because this is this is a complicated one and that's seconded by councilmember klein would you like to speak to your motion council yes Member? thank you as i said i th i think at the heart of this is actually design and i can recall when i first was on the city council and said to our planning director at the time someone very different then i couldn't imagine who built all those ugly houses and he said well i can't imagine then who bought all those ugly houses and i remember thinking then it is so much in the eye of the beholder we may argue about parking tonight we may argue about any number of other things but i was I was intrigued to watch tonight how many people have come to Palo Alto. I, and I hesitate to make it generational, but I've noticed that a number of people who have moved here in the young area and who seem to be enormously enthusiastic about the downtown. Our downtown is well known. I've you know, been all over the country identifying where I'm from, and people always say, you are so lucky to live in Palo Alto. You are really fortunate. Um, it's such a beautiful place. And somehow, I don't think, even though I, I heard this mentioned earlier tonight, Santa Barbara is also a beautiful place. They've made some very different decisions. They have stayed very consistent with their architecture. It's one way to go. We've, we've made some other decisions here. We've made some very concerted decisions to have diversity. We have diversity in our population, we have diversity in what we offer in our stores and our restaurants, and I think we offer diversity in our buildings. In this case, um, you know, you may like this building or not like this building, but to make, the, to make the argument about design just doesn't ring true to me. So I'm uh, making this recommendation. Thank you, Councilmember Klein, for your second. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Klein, would like to speak to your second. First, uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, and this is as much to the city attorney as anybody else, I just want to confirm what I think I heard before from the planning staff, that from a legal standpoint, the issue of parking is not before us tonight. Yes, Cara Silver, Senior Assistant City Attorney. That's correct. That's stated in, in the staff report as well. The only issue that is subject to the appeal is the architectural uh, review um, discretionary decision. Uh, parking is something that is um, uh, that was not appealed um, here and is not subject to this decision. If I just might add to that, it's apparent to the council, but to the public as a whole, Council has previously dealt with this issue in other contexts related to parking on this project. Correct, and uh, the result of that appeal uh, or that process was that the uh, applicant, the owner, the developer had to pay a significant more, a larger amount for in lieu parking fees. Okay. Uh, second, we have had tonight at our places and heard briefly from William Ross, uh, representing uh, Nielsen Buchanan, uh, making various objections uh, to um, the city's process here. Uh, does the city attorney's office have any opinion on Mr. Ross's letter and uh, representing Mr. Buchanan? Yes, thank you. Um, would you like me to start and, and chime in? So um, yes, Mr. Mr. Ross raised four letters uh, for four points in his letter. Um, first, he stated that um, there were insufficient findings um, in connection with the uh, decision, and those findings are set forth in detail in both the staff report and in the record of land use action. We do not think that that is um, a legally um, viable uh, uh, action, claim. Um, he also said that he made some reference to the variance um, that was issued at a, at a planning director level. Um, again, the variance is not subject to the appeal, um, and so we don't think that that's a legitimate claim. Um, third, with respect to CEQA, he stated that 
um, there was not a clear project description, um, that there was an, not a description of potential subdivisions that may occur on the project. Um, we believe that um, the project description was um, adequate in this case. Um, Mr. Ross brought a similar uh, project description case against the city um, in connection with the California Avenue uh, streetscape project. And um, the court went out of its way to say that um, a project description really just needs to um, inform the public of the very uh, general parameters of the, of the overall uh, project. Um, he also mentioned that the construction impacts um, were not identified in the mitigated negative declaration. Um, the, we do not um, agree with that. The um, uh, MND found that there would be no um, construction impacts given the city's standard mitigations for uh, construction. Um, and then he also uh, talked about the cumulative impact um, with respect to um, other projects going on in the city. That cumulative impact has been analyzed in the overall comp plan EIR, and um, we are still within the cap that was outlined in the comp plan EIR, so we don't think that that would be a legitimate claim either. Um, fourth, and his final argument was um, related to consistency, general plan consistency. Uh, he stated that there were no findings um, with respect to consistency. Um, we do disagree with that. There were findings, again, in the statement, uh, the record of land use action, that this project is consistent with the uh, comp plan. Um, with respect to his procedural argument that he raised in his verbal presentation, um, the um, council's protocols give the chair the ability to um, um, shorten uh, public comment on items, um, and uh, so we don't think that that's a leg legitimate um, comment. Also. Um, uh, the, the appellant was given a full 10 minutes um, with the ability to allocate as much time um, as they wanted within the overall group. Um, he also raised the issue of project description not including additional parking fees um, that would be paid as a result of this project that I guess is a, a project enhancement. Um, I don't think that needs to be described in the project description. Um, and then finally he raised the issue that uh, the MND did not uh, measure the tire index and the mitigated negative declaration does address the tire index in the traffic impact section and states that the uh, the impact, the tire index was not uh, triggered under um, the traffic analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> on the basis of what staff, sorry? Oh, Hillary had something? I, I, Cara's done a, a really thorough job. I guess the only thing I would say is this was a, a late letter. I mean, we got it as we walked into the room this evening. It's what we call in sequel parlance as a, a classic late hit. Um, all the more remarkable that Cara was so thorough in her rebuttal. Um, it, it's also very difficult to understand some of the arguments because it looks like some other project has been pasted into the arguments on this project. Um, but the only other thing I would add is that um, it's clear that parking issues have been discussed tonight as a policy issue. I, I don't think that's an issue in the CEQA context, uh, and the NEGDAC makes that pretty, the MND makes that very clear in its discussion of how parking is considered in the CEQA context, um, which is not to say the council hasn't recognized it as a policy issue that's warranted uh, the ordinance that you passed recently and, of course, next week's discussion of the residential permit parking program. Well, I, I just want to reiterate it. my understanding and I want to be very clear on this is that parking is not a legitimate concern for the council to have this evening is that correct that's a very serious policy issue for the city but not on this particular project it, it, it's not an issue in terms of the um, number of spaces and whether um, uh, in terms of the architectural review. 
Um, I think Hillary was mentioning parking in terms of the CEQA context. Um, under CEQA, parking is generally not considered an environmental impact except to the extent the, that um, an underparked project will create additional circulation, thus creating additional greenhouse gas impacts. And you know the, the uh, number of parking spaces um, that the deficit of the number of parking spaces we do not believe rises to the level of an environmental impact. Okay. I want to follow up on then with the one issue that I think is before us and that uh, uh, council member Nis has already addressed in her way and I want to address it in, in my way. Um, um, I, I think of three projects uh, uh, of, that I've seen during my life that have impacted me that came to mind tonight. Uh, two were a long time ago. I've been to Williamsburg, Virginia a couple of times in my life uh, and enjoyed Williamsburg a lot. And though I think almost everybody here knows about Williamsburg, uh, carefully preserved buildings or created buildings to evoke the, uh, the style of uh, 17th uh, century uh, colonial Virginia, uh, and that's very nice, but that's not Palo Alto to me. Uh, that's a museum, and I don't see us creating a museum here in Palo Alto of our, our buildings. Uh, the other was that I, a long time ago, had occasion to spend some time at the University of Maryland, uh, which at, at the time, and Jim, oh, Jim, who's <laughs> from that area, I'd forgotten that, uh, but my recollection of the University of Virginia, of Maryland was that it had a policy that all of its buildings had to be in the Georgian style. Uh, I hope that's still not true. I don't know. Maybe they did make some uh, eventual changes, at least in the architecture uh, school. Um, well, my, re <laughs> uh, uh, my recollection of it is of being there as a relatively young person was it was the most boring architectural campus I'd ever seen. It, 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 uh, it almost made the Soviets look good. <laughs> made the work. Soviets. I hope nobody here is about an alum of the University of Maryland, but uh, a funny that. Comment. I haven't asked if you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got a master's there also, but I do agree with your characterization. Um, that's not the way I want my city to be. Uh, I think that uh, the image that we reflect to the to the to the world is uh, one of being a cutting edge place that we're into innovation, high tech, uh, and I think that we want to have our downtown reflect that. Um, and in keeping with that, the third project that uh, comes to my mind immediately is the Apple Store on University Avenue. Uh, not part of this district, so it doesn't influence it, but uh, lots of glass. We had one person say, oh, does, does uh, the, gl the glass in this building would uh, uh, have a negative impact on people at, on University Avenue at night. Well, the corner right now, it couldn't be any darker. So, uh, uh, but I mentioned the Apple Store because my recollection uh, being there uh, on the day it opened was, and several days thereafter was, people taking pictures of it, standing in line to take pictures of the Apple Store. Uh, uh, I don't think people stand in line to take pictures of the Cardinal Hotel anymore. Uh, uh, the Apple Store had an appeal to people. And I think that, I don't know if this building is going to achieve that result, uh, uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, what people were saying is this is something that really appealed to them, that attracted them. And uh, I'm hopeful that will be the case with, with this particular building. And as I look at that area, uh, the, 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 the area bounded by uh, Ramona and Bryant and uh, uh, Hamilton. Uh, and this is sort of goes back to Lee Lippert's uh, taking us on a mental tour of that area. Uh, you have a series of buildings, almost all of which are, are a modern one, <coughs> modern taste. And I think that that's appropriate. Uh, we've preserved the Ramona uh, Street uh, as it is, and that's great. But uh, I think we're saying and we should be saying to the world, uh, we're a welcoming place, we're not stuck in some uh, time warp, 
and that we want to encourage our buildings as they get developed to reflect the time and culture that we are that we presently live in and I think this building does and therefore I will support the motion. Councilmember Price. Uh, thank you. Um, I will also be supporting the motion. Um, I feel very strongly uh, as other council members have said that we are known for our innovation, our creativity, our um, the pride in the history of Palo Alto, but we also are a city of diverse architectural styles uh, reflecting various periods. And in fact, uh, the world looks to us and Silicon Valley in general as a place that really reflects a variety of styles and is very, very inclusive in that way. Cities are very <coughs> organic and over time they really <coughs> reflect that. Um, Architecture is, is technically very challenging. As aesthetically, it has lots of important elements. It's related to imagination, creativity, and interpretation. And people have a variety of views of aesthetics, of art, and of architecture. And certainly tonight, we've heard uh, many of those points made. I feel that this uh, project is a, a very well-designed project. It's exciting, it provides the the anchor to that corner. It has uh, design elements that are consistent with the context-based uh, 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 design compatibility and the urban design guidelines. It provides the urban edge and many of the elements that have been so very, very well articulated here this evening. And I think it's important that we support a variety of architectural expression. I think it's expression and vitality that this city and this region is known for. And if we just have one style, we haven't had that, I don't know when that even existed. When you look back over the last 50, 60, 70 years, not all of those elements of the built environment were aesthetically pleasant necessarily or attractive. Now, many of the buildings, the Birch Clark buildings, for example, are exquisite. And I wanted to point out that in this town, we have a very strong commitment to historic preservation. And because of that, and because of longstanding interest in the importance of these historic buildings, we have a, uh, a number of buildings that are extremely attractive and reflect that mission style, the Mediterranean style, as illustrated by Burge Clark and many of his uh, contemporaries. So the city, very strongly supports, as the city evolves, a variety of architectural styles. And uh, for that reason and others that have been stated well, and I think the staff report addresses these issues uh, very well, um, I will be supporting this motion. I did want to take one exception, an exception to some statements that have been made because I'm quite upset about it, uh, which is related to any, um, assignment of malintent or personal gain for individuals who are part of the Architectural Review Board or any other board and commission uh, wh that serve this city. These are volunteers and we are lucky and blessed that people with expertise, knowledge, and real commitment to design and architecture, including, as the example, the Architectural Review Board, that we need to be thankful for the contributions individuals make. And I, I, I was sitting here and I've heard a couple of comments like that. I wanted to take very strong exception to that. Uh, again, these are all volunteers and if people make that kind of a comment, I think it's unfair, it's unwarranted, and I believe it's untrue. So I, I had to say something about that and again, that applies to all of the good people that serve on our boards and commissions, they work extremely hard. They're very attentive to their responsibilities and I think we need to be respectful in that way. So I know we're supposed to be focusing on the project, but I felt that this is an important part of this discussion as well. And uh, for those many reasons, I will very enthusiastically be supporting this motion. Council Member Holman. Um, yes, a few things. Um, and also, staff was going to respond to some questions I sent in that aren't related to the appeal, but they do relate to the regular land use action because they refer to use in square footage. 
Uh, yes, uh, Councilmember Holman, I apologize. We did get some questions from you earlier today that we just ran out of time to address in writing. Uh, you had, and in fact, one of the commenters this evening uh, raised some of the same questions. So uh, let me respond. More uh, cleverly the, than I might, I add. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question was about um, really the size of the building. And the existing building is 5,000 square feet plus the 2,000 square foot mezzanine. And you had asked some questions about whether the mezzanine was uh, um, legal, how long it had existed, um, and, and questions such as that. And, uh, you know, staff did some work uh, in consulting with the building department staff, and we believe that the mezzanine was built legally before August 28th of 1986, which is apparently the magic date uh, when any non-compliant facility may remain as it is or subsequently be, uh, be replaced. Um, I understand there have been uh, several other downtown projects where this same um, methodology of consulting with the chief building official and looking at this date has uh, come into play. The, uh, another project uh, that was cited as an example was the project involving the IDEO building. Um, uh, and perhaps staff can uh, go into more detail if you need it on that issue. Um, but it does... Um, does meet that requirement uh, and it is entitled to be replaced uh, even if it were demolished at some point. Uh, it's not a quote grandfathered use but it is a grandfathered facility uh, according to section 18.18.120 uh, and replacement of the floor area is allowed. So I think that response to the questions that we received from you earlier today, again I apologize for not um, getting to that in writing. So, I get, and the reason I brought this up is because of use. You said it's not a grandfathered use. So, if it's not, then we are out of balance, it would seem to me, because we've got um, less residential. According to the code, we would have 5,000 square feet of residential where we don't have uh, 5,000 square feet of residential if it's not a grandfathered use. I guess what, um, and I'm a little out of my league here, the distinction that um, we were trying to make in that response is that it's a grandfathered facility, so it's permitted to be, uh, to be there, to be counted and to be replaced if it were removed. Um, maybe staff could help me if there's anything else to add. Erin, do you get what I'm saying? It's, if it's not a grandfathered use, how can we have more FAR that's used for non-residential than what is allowed by code. I think I'm following what you're saying. The, so the grandfather facility allows a certain amount of uh, commercial space there. The TDRs on top of that allow additional amount of commercial yeah, I'm, space. I'm not questioning the TDRs. Okay. That's 5,000 square feet. It could be used however. Correct. So I'm talking about the base 10,000 square feet. And I tried to lay this out in the question. So the base 10,000 square feet, the code allows 5,000 square feet of non-residential, 5,000 square feet of residential. Boom, period. So if the 2,000 square foot mezzanine, let's pretend I've seen no evidence that it does exist or hasn't been demolished or whatever, and I think we might need to look at changing the code for that. But if it's not a grandfathered use, how come we don't have 5,000 square feet of residential? Give us a one second to, I, I'm not still not quite following the question, but let's see if we could figure it out. Well, code says you can have 5,000 square feet of residential, 5,000 square feet of non-residential. What's being allowed in this project is something like 34, I have to look at the number, something like 3,400 square feet or 3,600 square feet, whatever it is, of residential and all the rest of it is non-residential or commercial. That's n inconsistent with what code allows. So, director just said that the use is not grandfathered, the floor area ratio is grandfathered. So, while you, while you commiserate on that. Um, so, I'm going to go to the uh, architecture review findings. And, um, actually, first, I'm going to do something else first. So, I think the conversation tonight has kind of veered off into whether modern buildings are okay or 
traditional buildings are okay or whatever. And really what the code talks about and what the findings talk about um, and what our, um, uh, yeah, the ARB findings and the urban design guide talk about are compatibility. And if a building is modern, it isn't necessarily compatible. It's not necessarily incompatible. If a building is traditional, it's not necessarily compatible either. It's, it's how a building is compatible, and those, those criteria are laid out fairly clearly in, um, in uh, both the part of the code that picks up uh, the SOFA 2 cap compatibility standards and also the urban design guide. So the, um, uh, so when new construction shares general characteristics and establish design linkages, that's what a building is required to do. Um, to be to be compatible, um, it talks about uh, you know uh, materials, uh, pattern of roof lines and projections, uh, size and proportion of orientation and orientation of windows, uh, shadow patterns from massing and decorative features. Where, and, I, and I'm a fan of many of the you know you put sort of your resume up here on the on the screen, uh, uh, Ken, and I'm a fan of many of your buildings. I think this one misses the mark. To be able to say that. Um, the window patterns, you know, reflect or are compatible with the buildings across the street. Um, if you have to highlight the windows to indicate where the windows are, I think that misses the point because what you see is, and it's even described in the staff report, if not your description of the project, that it's a glass curtain wall. So there is no differentiation. There is no punctuation of these windows as being reflective or compatible with or picking up design elements uh, that establish design linkages with buildings across the street. Um, if you look at the ARB finding number two, it says the design is compatible with the immediate environment, blah, 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 blah. And it says the project is designed as a, a four-story, 50-foot um, building that is adjacent to similarly sized buildings. There's absolutely no reference to design compatibility. It doesn't mention the design of the building at all. Um, finding four, in areas considered by the board as having a unified design character, historic character, the design is compatible with such character. Um, again, there's no reference to the design of the building. None. Um, uh, it also, <laughs> interestingly, a B of number four says, the project provides varied building uh, mass and height while uh, finding number two talks about how, you know, it's basically another one of the, yet another one of the four-story uh, four buildings that should be there. Uh, finding number six, the design is compatible with approved improvements both on and off the site. Uh, the new building is compatible with the existing context of the retail commercial downtown environment. It's a circuitous argument. It says it's compatible because it's compatible. And I've had, for years, I've had issues with these kinds of findings that are just basically circuitous. So I can't make those findings. Um, I don't think, think those findings are, um, are um, uh, adequate. Did you come up with an answer? You look like you might have. Yes, I have. Um, so the way that transfer development rights work is that you could transfer up to 1.0 FAR above what exists on the site. So since there is 7,000 square feet that currently exists on the site, it's a 5,000 square foot lot, you can now get a total of 12,000 square feet of commercial space on the site. There is 11,527 square feet of commercial space proposed, so it falls underneath that 12,000 square foot limit. They get up to the 3.0 FAR by you know, having about 3,500 square foot of a residential floor area on top of that. I think I need that in writing. I didn't follow it. I, I didn't follow that. But it does. But it does bring up the other question that I had because the response to my question, it's on packet packet page 541. Um, it says that uh, the applicant is using uh, 4,327 square feet. And this is part of the question I submitted. Um, um, says the, and this is my question in response to an answer. It says that the applicant is using a TDR of 4,327 square feet, but the applicant is using TDR parking exemption for 5,000 square feet. So my question is, how could you use more parking exemption than you're using TDR square footage? Don't they have to marry up? And it might just be numbers, but this doesn't make sense. Okay, now, now they are gonna apply the entire 5,000 on both. 
um, both okay. the floor area ratio as well as the parking. Okay, maybe you might try just one more time how they get sure. less residential than is required by code. Sure, so the way the code reads is you have your best base FAR, which is determined by what you're grandfathered in. So right now they have a 7,000 square feet of grandfathered commercial space, space on a 5,000 square foot lot. Director said that the 2,000 square foot mezzanine is not a, a grandfathered use. She said it was a grandfathered facility, which is the, the grandfathered facility allows as commercial space. So it's a grandfathered facility of 7,000 square feet. Then you transfer in development rights for 5,000 square feet above that. That gets you to a 12,000 square foot cap. Okay. Um, also, just, just a couple of things, and I won't belabor this, but um, the uh, responses also to questions um, about APE, area potential effect. Um, this isn't SOFA, but even in the um, uh, urban design guide, it talks about how many historic buildings there are there. You know, both the buildings across the street and the one across Caddy Corner across the, the corner are historic buildings. The staff report says that, and the response here says that the uh, Raposada building is not historic. It, and I think this is partially just because there's not institutional memory on the part of staff, but the reason it's not on the uh, inventory is because no buildings have been added to the inventory unless the applicant has asked for them to be in decades since the, since the inventory was done. So the fact that it's um, potentially eligible for California Register is actually it demonstrates there's evidence that it is historic. There isn't evidence that it isn't historic. So it's, it's just a, it's a misnomer there. So um, I think the, the consideration that the historic buildings are given here in terms of area potential effect is um, really given short shrift. And I'm, again, I'm not arguing for uh, replicating historic styles, but I am arguing very strongly for compatibility and, um, and a, a consideration of those historic buildings in the historic context. So um, since I can't make the uh, findings, oh, and one last thing, about differentiation, two things actually. Differentiation, the secretary standards do call for di differentiation. They do not, they do not uh, call for, and I know this is a topic of much dis discussion, but um, the secretary standards in terms of differentiation do not require that you go <coughs> 180 degrees from, from what's there. It could be something that's, you know, um, similar but different. It doesn't have to be modern versus, versus traditional. The other thing is um, after I um, made my comments or after we all did our disclosures, I'd forgotten all about this. I did meet long ago with Doug Smith, but it was not about this project, just to be clear on that since he brought it, was, it was just about design in general uh, when he was looking to do his study. So I didn't want anybody to think I hadn't, um, hadn't come clean on that. So I'm going to um, move that the uh, appeal be uh, upheld on the basis of not being able to make uh, the ARB findings. Second. All right. So you're making a substitute motion, just to yes. be clear. Um, would you like to speak to further to your motion? I think I've spoken enough. Um, and uh, Council Member Schmidt, would you like to speak to your second? Yeah, just briefly, I am, I've heard uh, people tonight talk about parking and traffic, and I consider that a, a major issue in the area of putting uh, more cars on the street. I understand that this is not subject to appeal. Uh, I've heard a discussion of the history of the uh, mezzanine uh, floor and, uh, you know, would like to see documentation, but I do understand that this is not subject to appeal. Uh, I think the applicant made a request for a variance on setback to the street. Uh, and I understand this is not subject to appeal. Uh, but for me, the variance request was a discretionary decision. And I guess it gave me what I feel the discretion to talk about design compatibility. 
So for me, looking at Ramona Street, on the west side, from Forest to University, and on the east side, from Hamilton to University, is a special area. It happens to be the most popular street in Palo Alto. It has a unified uh, feel, look, design characteristic to it. And uh, I feel that the applic applicant does not fit into that design characteristic. Um, Councilmember Burke. All right, first I want to thank Councilmember Klein for bringing forward uh, the clarifications on uh, what is appropriately before us tonight. And, um, and I also want to uh, agree with uh, Councilmember Klein and Councilmember Price about their arguments that, um, that mimicry is not a required architectural style in Palo Alto by any means. Um, and, but I do want to point out that the fact that we have a misguided and uh, uh, inappropriately claimed appeal does not mean that, that the opposite is, is necessarily true. I, I think we've been arguing in a false dichotomy around this this issue of mimicry. The fact that I also agree we should not require mimicry by any means doesn't mean that there's this project is necessarily should be approved and that the findings apply. So I want to stick to the business at hand, which is whether it meets the findings, including the compliance with the comprehensive plan, which is basically we have program L29, which drives us to the downtown design guidelines, downtown design guidelines, which I spent too much of this weekend rereading and asked for them to be supplied to my colleagues so that we'd all be really dwelling on that and looking at the findings in that context, because that's the real main issue before us. And, um, and I think as I, I look at those guidelines, um, what actually made the most compelling case to me was actually uh, Mr. Hayes' presentation on uh, a number of the projects that have been done in the, in the downtown and that in fact he's done in the downtown, which are um, compatible. They have modernist elements that fit well within uh, often adjacent or even integrated historic components to a building. Um, and I think they really show excellent examples of the sort of exceptional design that we're looking for in the downtown that is compatible, which can be compatible can mean that it is uh, uh, very deliberately modernist in contrast to the adjacent building. If you, if you think of the, the Cantor Museum at Stanford and the historic front half and the modernist back half and I challenge anybody to look at that and say, okay, those are very distinctly a century apart buildings, each with their own exceptional architectural character, and they are compatible. And uh, that's one of the things that Ken Hayes has done in a number of other buildings that I've admired. When I look at the uh, Alma and Forest Street entryway between the all new and more modernist uh, Pete's Coffee building and the Ellison's building that incorporated an historic component in a modernist building. I think those are really great and they show what we should be doing. I can't find that in this building and in fact I find a number of areas where if we really carefully read what we're required to do in terms of making findings and look at the downtown design guidelines, I don't see how it does it. Uh, Mr. Hayes actually made the, the point on one of his cover sheets there's a little bit of a contradiction in the design guidelines on whether this is part of the Civic Center Plaza segment of it or the Hamilton. And when I read the design guidelines, it's actually in both. And, and it's highlighted in both. So the staff had referenced the Hamilton. Uh, Ken Hayes had referenced the Civic Center. Um, 
and the Civic Center one, it actually says that it should on, this is on the, um, the edges, uh, which are a corner like this, uh, it should be two to three story buildings. Now we, we look at these um, buildings that were cited by the architect as being uh, compatible, which are the, the large edge buildings, the Cardinal Hotel, and then on the other end of uh, the same block on Hamilton, which is the Thoits building. And those are both three-story buildings, and those are the prominent buildings. And they are not, there's nothing in this area that is essentially glass-walled buildings. And Council Member Klein made the point that because, for instance, the Apple Store, or I can cite other examples where glass has been used in architecture in exceptional ways, therefore any glass building must, can't be refuted as, as being uh, uh, not distinctive and exceptional. I, I don't buy that. Just like, no, just because masonry is good in some places doesn't mean all masonry is good. Um, so when I look at this and when I see the descriptions, this is a four story glass wall building with not a great deal of other really exceptional architecture to it. And when I look at the compatibility to the adjacent buildings, on either side are one and two story buildings. Um, that doesn't mean that this must be one and two story. It also doesn't mean that it has a distinctive right to be four stories, uh, in particular with materials and designs that aren't compatible. When, when I look at the, um, the street views that are used uh, against the most prominent buildings there, the largest buildings, um, there are certain floors that are aligned, but these are against the, the three-story buildings, and this is a four-story building. These are primarily uh, uh, masonry-type or concrete masonry-type uh, materials uh, with exceptional characteristics to the ones. Uh, the Thoits building, when it went through, went through a great deal of architectural consideration. The Cardinal Hotel, I disagree that people don't take pictures of it anymore. Um, uh, but this building, I, I don't see its compatibility with any of that environment. I, don't, I certainly don't see it when you look down Ramona Street, but that's not really a standard I'm setting. I'm looking at the urban design guidelines when you look at the Hamilton Avenue description. It talks about uh, continuity there. It's not as if it has that um, a single uh, architectural style that we're, and we're not requiring that. I, I would be uh, receptive to something that is a modern style building at this corner. Uh, I think the size and the mass and scale of it um, are out of balance with the other prominent buildings on uh, those corners that I cited. And I certainly think that the, the materials and the, the glass predominance and a number of other aspects are also um, inappropriate. So I, I, I do also want to concur with Council Member Price. Uh, I think once again, it, having uh, opponents make scurrilous personal attacks on our commission members does not make it easy for us to stand up for what we may think is right when we uh, might be in agreement with some arguments. This, this kind of action in, by the community has really got to come to a halt. And, um, and I'll say that as a sidebar, um, but it's just irresponsible and lacks integrity. I can disagree with the Architectural Review Board on their particular interpretation of what is appropriate under these downtown design guidelines. But uh, that's, that's not the same as, as making unfounded personal accusations against them. So, um, so I'm going to support the substitute motion and I really encourage my colleagues to, to get out of the box of whether we're reacting against a, an appeal that we don't agree with a particular basis for the appeal and instead stick to our obligations and duties to review according to the architectural requirements 
and the findings, in particular for me in sections three and four, um, and the number of places where this project, as proposed, uh, does not comply, and quit reacting to things we're offended by, by other people's appeals. Let's be objective and look at, at this project on its merits or lack of them. Vice Mayor Shepard. Um, first off, I, I, I guess we have two motions here and um, I will be uh, not supporting the alternate, the uh, substitute motion and I will be waiting for the original motion to come forward if this one does not uh, succeed. And uh, I too have spent um, a good portion of last evening going through the downtown uh, urban design guidelines. And I was uh, not, I was surprised by how articulate it is. Uh, I understand, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin Bernstein, for reminding us all that these are not um, policy, et cetera, but on the other hand, it was adopted by council, and these are some of the tools that we send our um, building and, and land owners downtown out with, and so uh, I, I, I look at this particular segment of the uh, guidelines to be similar to the way Council Member Burt does between the two districts, it's a little bit of a void or, or a vacuum it's in between the two and called out the two. So um, the civic cross access district is, is more prominent um, in the guidelines from what I could tell. So I found these, um, the things that uh, I did look for was on page 23, this particular building was flagged as a specific building or area that should be taller to create outdoor space. Uh, I think that this building is taller. It's as tall as it can be in downtown right now, uh, 50 foot height. Uh, on page 28, it says this is a corner, um, corner ground floor buildings, maintain zero setback lines, et cetera, and yet, this building is pulling in and having an, the second floor goes out. And so there's more uh, sidewalk space, which is what we've been at, which is what we've asked for in this area. On page 34, it calls out this particular corner to, to be strong building volume. I'm not exactly sure what strong building volume means, but I'm sure it's got something to do with um, being it needs needing to be considered taller um, to create outdoor space. So um, it then gets down to, in my consideration of this project and the certain appeal that we have, and I think that there's a certain agreement among colleagues that there are other things that could, that this appeal does, uh, appeal does not address. That but looking just at the design of this building, then it gets into um, compatibility, which as I learned sitting through HRB meetings, the historic resources meetings, that um, this does not mean that it is old fashioned style. As a matter of fact, um, uh, I was uh, very impressed by the way the um, historic resources board addressed the modern building that replaced the historic building on the corner of Lincoln and I wanna say Bryant. I can't remember if that was the right location or not, but it's now built. And so they looked carefully at the eaves, the slope of the roof, the, the, the height of the building, et cetera, to see whether it was compatible in a historic district, Professorville. Um, and, uh, but it is definitely a modern building. There's no, it's in mis not mistakable when you go by it. So I, I do believe that compatibility is defined, but it's not defined by the city. It's defined I'm not sure if it's defined in the secretary standards or if it's just a, a, an architectural term of definition. That's something that I'm not clear about, but there is a, an understanding of, of how compatibility is defined. So then it gets down to my personal preference um, with the design of this building, and I have to admit that um, 
Mr. Hayes, when you showed us the uh, Joseph Banks building, I, I liked that one better with balconies and an arched and a, a curvature of a roof, et cetera, which gets me back to one of the emerging concerns that I'm having is that whether or not we should discuss the concept of holding to certain square footage that is permissible you know, on a site like this is about as maximum as you can get on this site. Um, I know you've dug out for a basement for the parking for the residences on top, but there's not much more you can fit into because of a 50 foot height limit, which then brings us into the framework of design of a box in order to capture that, especially if you've spent money purchasing transfer of development rights. So somebody else is not using this right to develop this property. They sent it over to somebody else in the same area. And so it's a no, no net new square footage. Um, it's just buildable on a different site in exchange for um, enhancing a historic building and seismically retrofitting and rebuilding it, modernizing it for, for today and current use which I think is an important incentive for this area because I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know if, I, I think we need to have incentives for people to be able to go in and do these very, very costly and expensive upgrades in order to keep our historic sites. So at some point, I think it would be very useful, uh, you know, if you ask me which building I like better, the University Arts Building or the proposal for this site, the former Radio Shack site, uh, the University Arts Building is my favorite building in downtown. It just is. I, I sit there in City Hall Plaza sometimes when I'm waiting to speak to meet with somebody, and I, I just like looking at the different balconies and the, the different styles of wrought iron that they've decided to, to pick out at different spots. But it is clearly well over the 50-foot height limit. And so um, if there's a way that we could get the uh, differentiation in design and balconies and intrigue again, I, I think that, and, and I think I use the term differentiation inaccurately here, but I, I guess what I'm interested in is seeing, seeing that, that, that third dimension come back um, when buildings are designed um, so that we are not having just a replica of the cube um, and, uh, and that we can take a look at uh, more options. But I think that that's a different uh, process that we don't have yet. And but I think that we might be having parts of those conversations coming forward because, in the comprehensive plan, we have allowed um, the Plan and Transportation Commission to consider going up to the 60-foot height limit. But um, I think that um, but we haven't made any plans to go over that and um, or any and there is no policy right now. So. But I, but I wouldn't mind having that conversation to see if we can't get to the meat of this, which is, I, you know, a more diverse design of the modern buildings downtown. So I will not be supporting the alternate motion. I will be supporting the original motion on this. Councilmember Berman. So the first thing I want to do is uh, thank the appellant for the appeal um, because that allowed us the time to update our parking exemptions uh, and apply the updated parking exemptions to this project, which I supported and, and I think was appropriate. Um, you know, we were restricted in what we can do in regards to TDRs and, and things that are essentially already uh, property, um, but we're able to make some updates that, that were probably long overdue uh, and apply them here and, and you know, get in lieu fees for a couple more, a couple more spots, which I think um, in time will we'll hopefully begin to help the parking congestion downtown. That said, I'm, I'm not gonna support the appeal. Um, the appeal mentions a couple of historic buildings downtown uh, as, as kind of examples, and, and I like all of those buildings. Um, but when I, I kind of travel around downtown, I, a couple of buildings that really jumped out to me that, that I really, really like are 820 Ramona and 260 Homer uh, and 270, 278 University, the, the Keene building. These are newer, modern buildings um, that I think are, are very um, kind of well done. Um, and, and these are buildings that, you know, are, are gonna be downtown until 2040, until 2050. And I don't think they should look like, I don't think they need to look like buildings that were built in 1940 and 1950. I think um, there's, there's something to be said, uh, a woman in the audience 
said it best. I can't remember exactly how she said it, but there's there's something to be said for um, you know having modernity as as well. Um, I was kind of reminded. I can't remember where I read it, um, but reminded of when I uh, is it Joseph Eichler when Joseph Eichler um, started building his his houses in Palo Alto and people hated him um, and thought that they were modern and ugly and. Um, they were bringing in, you know, too many folks from out of town that, that folks didn't want to be in town, and um, now we idolize him. And I think, you know, I don't know what the percentage of the homes in Palo Alto are Eichlers, but a lot of them. Um, and, and so I think in hindsight, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to make comparisons um, between the buildings, but it's just important to keep in mind that, um, you know, things change and, and sometimes we look back and appreciate that change when we didn't necessarily appreciate it at the time. Um, I'll, I'll, I hope people don't slam my dad on the blogs, uh, but my dad said it in a kind of funny way when I was chatting with him about stuff, and he said, you know, if, if we never allowed for, you know, modern improvements, we'd all be living in mud huts. Um, and, and that might be... Uh, Did you disclose that you talked to your dad on this? I, 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 excuse me, I forgot to disclose that I talked to my dad and that he influenced me. Um, but I think that's what he's supposed to do. And not necessarily in regards to this, he just put it in a funny way. Um, this site's in a, in a, in a tricky location. Uh, on one side, you've got the Ramona Historic District. On the other side, you've got Civic Center Plaza. On the Hamilton side, you've got um, the, I think it's 200 Hamilton. Um, and I think that there a lot, there, there are some compatible features um, with, with some of these other buildings. Obviously, it's a new modern building. Obviously, it's not gonna fit in uh, perfectly with, with a lot of the historic buildings around it. Um, I, I don't love it. I like it. I don't love it. Um, but uh, I think it'll be, but I hate that corner now. Um, and, and I think that, you know, what you guys have done with uh, increasing the widths of the sidewalks and, and these types of things are gonna make that a much more pleasurable pedestrian experience um, in what is now you know, a really awkward, claustrophobic, weird, I think that's probably the corner where most people bump into each other by accident because you can't see around the corner. Um, and I think that'll change a lot of this and, and really um, add some value. So I understand people's frustrations um, you know, I, I, architecture is, it's art, uh, and it's always going to be in the eye of the beholder, and, and folks are always going to find uh, things that they don't like. I can find things that I don't like. We can all find things we don't like. Um, but uh, on the whole, I, I think it's a, it'll be a good addition to downtown. Well, with that, let's vote on the substitute motion. And the substitute ma motion fails on a six to three vote with council members Burt, um, Schmidt, and Holman voting yes. And now if we could vote on the main motion. <coughs> and that main motion passes on a six to three vote with council members Burt, Holman, and Schmidt voting no. And with that, the meeting's adjourned. and uh, one of the things that